Ah, uh, who doesn't like a good puppy? You just had to get two. <laughs> ah, well, can you believe it? 14 days from today is Christmas Eve. Everybody's got their shopping done, right? <laughs> For those of you who could not join us last week, uh, last week we began our journey through Advent by hearing how Jesus is our hope, the hope that our world needs. A hope that's like a candle, like a candle on the Advent wreath that's been lit and that's been lit within our hearts so that we can serve as God's children, as beacons in the world, the light of God's world and the light of hope in the world, especially for those who don't have hope or for those who are just living in darkness their entire lives. And we need some hope to get through the day. And we heard that message through the first chapter of Nehemiah where ironically that word hope isn't found even once, but yet that hope that Nehemiah had could be seen all over that book and especially throughout his prayer. Well, today, in like fashion, we're turning to another book in the Bible. We're going to be looking at the book of Isaiah, chapter 40. And we're looking again at that second candle on the Advent wreath, that candle of love. And, and like it was last week with Nehemiah, the word love isn't found anywhere in or near Isaiah chapter 40. In fact, it's about five chapters away where you can actually see that word love in Hebrew. But in that particular chapter, that word love isn't found at all, but yet love, it's sandwiched, it's smacked all throughout that entire chapter as we're going to see. That virtue is throughout Isaiah's message, and that's what we're going to look at for this morning. So let's just open up our Bibles. If you brought a Bible with you, let me invite you to, to grab your Bible, open it up to Isaiah chapter 40, and we're going to hear all about this glorious love that appeared for us all but we're going to do that a little bit differently. Instead of just starting out at verse 1, which we just heard in our first lesson, we're going to jump around the book just a little bit. And we hear this in verse 9. O Zion, messenger of good news, shout it from the mountaintops. Shout it louder, O Jerusalem. Shout and do not be afraid. Tell the towns in Judah your God is coming. The word in here is evangelists that we're hearing. And if I were to paraphrase this, I, I would write it something like, Oh, Zion, be like evangelists. And shout it out on the mountaintop, scream it out loud. Oh, the city of my birth, Jerusalem, oh, Zion. Tell everyone all around that God himself is on the way. You know, Isaiah wrote this. He said this. God gave him these words 700 years before Mary ever gave birth to the Son of Man. And these words that Isaiah would have given to his people at the time, they would have been comforting. They would have been comforting to the people of Judea, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, his hometown, because they were living in turbulent times of political, social, and even religious chaos, if you will. Not too dissimilar from times today, actually. And in verses 1 and 2, with these words of comfort, we hear Isaiah say this, Comfort, comfort, O my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Tell her that her sad days are gone and that her sins are pardoned. Yes, the Lord has punished her twice over for all of her sins. Isaiah was saying, Take heart, all my people. Our days of sadness are going to end through God's forgiveness. And he continued on in verse 5, saying that God's glorious love would one day be revealed and that everyone, everyone would see it. He was saying every soul could be comforted. Because the Lord in all of his divine glory would be visible in Judea. That everyone around, if they so chose, would be able to look upon his physical presence and to see the living God before them. We hear about this word glory. Sing this morning about the glory of the Lord. Have you ever wondered, 
what does the glory of the Lord really look like? I have. We read about it. We hear that the glory of the Lord is manifest in the nature and the character and the physical presence of the Lord himself. One that invaded earth, if you will, as he made his presence visible. That's really what it means to, to think upon the glory of the Lord. What the glory of the Lord is, is God in his full presence coming and being among us. In the gospel according to John, we hear these beautiful words that how that happened, just as Isaiah said it would. And John chapter 1, verse 14 says this, So the word became human and made its home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. So John here, especially in verse 17, was putting a name and a face to the glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord is fully personified in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus, who was born Christ the Messiah, is the revelation of God's glory for you and I in our lives. He was that glorious appearing through his loving actions then, and one day he will come again in his glory with power, and he will reward everyone according to what we have done. And Isaiah prophesied that as well. Jesus is the Lord of God's glorious love. And Isaiah shared how God would be glorified through his love. And we go now to our key verse for this morning. We hear this from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 11. Listen to these character attributes of how the glorious love of God is made manifest in this earth. Isaiah wrote, He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will carry the lambs in his arms, holding them close to his heart. He will gently lead the mother's sheep with their young. As we hear in John chapter 10, Jesus said that he is the good shepherd. And as the good shepherd, he laid down his life for us upon the cross of Calvary. He willingly went to his cross to take upon our sins. And as the Apostle Paul said in his second letter to the church in Corinth, he said, Jesus, who was without sin, became the offering for our sins so that we could be made right with God, so that we could be made in the righteousness of God. And he did that in love. You know, Jesus' sacrifice was the apex of God's love, right? It was his love in action. And for you and me as Christians, that's everything for us. But you know what? While we would never, ever diminish that at all, that wasn't the only portion of Jesus' love. He also loved people every day of his life in every way that they longed and needed to be loved. I, I swear to you, Terry and I did not collude at all, did we? I started to hear your story as I was walking to grab a bottle of water, and I'm like, oh my gosh. Because <laughs> the other day, as I was thinking about this message... I was just sitting back and I was like thinking and pondering and musing and like staring off into the nothingness. And one dog was here on one piece of furniture and another dog was here on this piece of furniture. And they were both seemingly sleeping and napping. I looked over at Arlo, I caught his eye and he completely ignored me. He was doing his own thing. But then I caught little Gus Gus's eye. And he was curled up in this tiny little donut, as boxers tend to do. And as I looked at him, his eye caught mine, and his head kind of cocked, and his eyes opened wide, 
and his head popped up. And the next thing I know, his tail started to thump. And so I just decided to play this little itty-bitty game of peekaboo with my puppy. I'm like, peekaboo, Gus, Gus. And the more I acknowledged Gus, the more that tail started to thump. And his body got all excited. And I was like, peekaboo, Gus. And thump, 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 goes the, thump, goes the tail. And next thing I know, Gus is getting up and his whole body is starting to wiggle as boxers do. And he got down off the couch and he came right before me and he sat right beneath my feet, just wiggling his whole body and his face lit up. And I patted my legs, come here, Gus. And he put his front paws on me and I picked up up just to give him a big hug. And as I gave him a big hug and held him close to my heart, I got licks all over the face and wet willies in the ears and all that. Gus just wanted to be loved. He got a bunch of smooches from dad, and as soon as he had had enough love, he got down willingly on his own, and then he laid down right beneath my feet and curled up into another little ball. You know, like every creature on this earth, Gus Gus longs to be loved. He wanted a little love from his human dad. Like Gus Gus, like Terry and Jason's pups, you and I long to be loved too. We long to be loved by our heavenly father, do we not? And as I did with my little Gus Gus, Jesus searched us out long before we ever caught eye of him. And as I picked up my little boy and I held him close to my chest, Jesus carried us in his arms and he holds us close to his heart throughout the entirety of our lives. And just as I felt blessed when Gus sat beneath my feet, I have to imagine that Jesus himself feels joy when we sit beneath his feet and give him the fullest expression of our adoration. And if that's true for me, and I bet that's true for you, that's got to be true for our neighbors as well. Would you not say, everyone longs to be loved. You and I are privileged. And yes, I use that word correctly. You and I are privileged because we know Jesus Christ is the revelation of God's glorious love. He came to light our hearts and to live within us with the presence of his love. But he doesn't just want us to hoard that love for ourselves. No, he wants us to share that love with the whole world. In the gospel according to John chapter 21, we hear the story right before Jesus ascended, how he had met up with his disciples in Galilee. They were out fishing. He met them. They shared some lunch together. And during that lunch, he called Peter over to his side. We've heard the story, and he says, Peter, do you love me? I said, Jesus, you know I love you. He said, feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. Take care of them. We hear this story. This, this goes back three times. Jesus, love on my people. As I loved on you, Peter, I need you to love on my people while I am gone. We like to think of Peter as, as a pastor, and he was. But you know what? Peter is really a representation of all of us, not just the pastors in our lives who tend to stand up here like I am, but Peter is all of us. He is a disciple of Jesus Christ. And as Jesus was telling Peter, look, I have forgiven you, I've restored you. Now I want you to take that love, that forgiveness that I have given you, and I want you to share that with the world. Jesus is calling on all of us to take that gift of love that he's given every single one of us and to share it with the world, to take that light of love within our heart and to light the wick of someone else within their heart who maybe has yet to feel the presence of God's love in their lives. As I close this message out, I, I want to ask you this question. What can you do for the guy or gal across the street to help them experience the love of Jesus and the love of God? 
so that they can have him close to their heart as well. What better gift can you give this Christmas time than the gift of Jesus' love to someone in need? Follow Jesus and love as he loved. Do as Peter did and light the wick of God's love within the heart of another human being by sharing them with the greatest gift of love that you yourself have received, the gift of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And amen and amen. Let us pray.